I think it was a series of mistakes, a series of many small mistakes that added up to being a deadly error. We're just days away from the trial of A-list celebrity Alec Baldwin for his part in the deadly Rust movie shooting. All roads lead back to the weapon Baldwin had in his hands, the moment two crew members were shocked, one of which later died. And I just feel like this thing went so sideways, what should have been a workplace accident investigation, I think, uh, is now a, a second manslaughter trial. It's To me, it's I'm, I'm, we're still boggled by this. Now we're hearing from an expert Hollywood armorer who has worked on movie and TV sets for decades. Being that he's the shiny object and someone can get a feather in their cap by prosecuting and convicting an actor, that's probably lending itself to why this uh, prosecution is happening the way it is. He says Baldwin's claim that he never pulled the trigger could actually be the truth. And I've seen how it is possible that hammer can be pulled back and dropped without actually pulling that trigger. All this means this weaponry expert believes the charges aren't justified. I really don't think Baldwin should, should have been charged in this. I think it was a, a workplace accident. Baldwin heads to trial next week for the alleged crime that happened on October 21st, 2021. At the time, the low-budget movie Rust was filming at the Bonanza Creek Ranch, a western film set in Santa Fe, New Mexico. In between takes, Baldwin was blocking out a scene when the Colt 45 in his hands went off. Director Joel Souza and cinematographer Helena Hutchins were both shocked. Souza was treated and survived the injury, but Hutchins' wounds were much more severe. She died hours later at a trauma center in Albuquerque. How's it going, sir? Um, so uh, my understanding, um, the, you, were, you were in the room when the lady when someone I was, was the shot? The, gun, yeah. the investigation started right away, and what followed were months of back and forth. Baldwin and the film's armorer, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, were both charged with involuntary manslaughter. The charges were later dropped, but they were both charged again. The trial of Gutierrez-Reed was held this spring, and Baldwin is set to be tried in Santa Fe County next week. Leading up to that, we sat down with Hollywood armorer Dutch Merrick to understand the logistics of prop weaponry and get his take on the case as a whole. Well, uh, having seen this over the last, what, two, two and a half years, I think that everything really came off the rails. Uh, you know, I, I've been a studio armorer for nearly 30 years, and so any incident that involves an accident with a prop gun is right on our radar. And in, in the last hundred years, that's exactly two incidences until this. And uh, the best example was Brandon Lee, where there was a blank gun loaded with a blank, but at some point earlier in a previous day, there was a, a bullet lodged in the barrel and it hadn't been checked. So that combination of events led, and an actor pointing a gun at Brandon Lee and pulling the trigger took his life. And so we've all studied that really extensively and it was ruled an industrial accident. It was a workplace accident. It wasn't manslaughter, it wasn't homicide, it was nothing like that. In this case, to me, even though there was negligence involved by various people, doesn't smack of a manslaughter trial. And I just feel like this thing went so sideways, what should have been a workplace accident investigation, I think, uh, is now a, a second manslaughter trial. It's To me, it's I'm, I'm, we're still boggled by this. Dutch says the Rust shooting is only the third in Hollywood history that resulted in death. In 1984, actor John Eric Hexum died on the set of the CBS show Cover Up when he accidentally shot himself in the head. At the time, he was holding a prop gun and pretending to play Russian roulette. Then, in 1993, Brandon Lee died on the set of The Crow when he was filming a death scene. The gun was supposed to have a blank inside of it, but an autopsy found a bullet had been lodged in his spine. Going off the Brandon Lee shooting, that was my first thought. After this rust shooting happened with Alec Baldwin, I thought back to The Crow several decades prior. And there are parallels between the two, but it's interesting that you brought up one is an involuntary manslaughter case and the other was ruled a mistaken accident. So were there procedures put into place after that Brandon Lee shooting in order to secure future sets? Well, certainly we redoubled our efforts as prop masters, prop people, armorers to always check the gun every time, which we already did. But they added, uh, it's every time now you also check the barrel for an obstruction. And we can do that with either a flashlight or just a dowel or a rod or even a chopstick. Uh, we'll go in the barrel just to show that there's no object in the barrel 
and then you see that you're, you have a blank and the gun is clear. I mean, it's, just, it's one more step that was added in, but it, it's a step that really should have been in place. Most people were already doing it. There's all sorts of movies that are using weaponry, and we've only heard of these two, maybe three incidents <laughs> forever. So this isn't very common, is it? Well, let me provide you some context. And, and this case has an outsized public view, an outsized response, because it has an A-list star involved in it, certainly. Uh, I, I just finished seven seasons, seasons on the CBS show SEAL Team. Now, on that show, and now that's a, a gung-ho, shoot 'em up military action show. On that t TV show, we figured out that in seven seasons, we used just short of two million blank rounds fired safely. Now, that's one TV show with two million blanks and never an accident, never an injury, and, you know, God forbid, no, never a death. And when we look at the industry as a whole, we figured out, we started collectively doing the math with the different vendors and prop masters that we expend tens of millions of blank rounds every single year in Hollywood. Now, if we've been, you know, over a hundred years, that's hundreds and hundreds of millions of blank rounds. And now we're up to three deaths. That is a statistical anomaly. It is a true outlier event. And there has been an outsized response, uh, a real overcorrection because of this with a craft that is essentially really the one of the safest crafts you'll find on a film set due to the diligence and the practices that we have for our craft. Compare it to uh, camera operators who have fallen out of helicopters and fallen off mountainsides or uh, uh, what we call prop makers, which you would call a carpenter who have fallen out of condors and scissor lifts and been crushed by walls. And we just recently have a, have a grip fall out of the, the up, up overhead perms in one of the stages here in Los Angeles who died from a fall. So falls and other accidents are far outshadow anything that has happened with a blank firing prop gun on a film set. Merrick calls the rush shooting a statistical anomaly. So what went wrong? Uh, that leads to my next question in relation to rust, because obviously there was a death in this situation. So was there negligence on the set? This incident, as with so many, are not the product of a single error, a single oversight, a single problem. This was a cascade of errors that built up. To explain all this, Merrick uses an analogy commonly used in regards to aviation. I want you to imagine a block of Swiss cheese. When you slice into it, there are holes in the slice. And the next slice, the holes are in a different spot. And the next slice, the holes are in yet another spot. Each of those slices of cheese represents defensive barriers against an accident. So the first slice of cheese might be the design of the aircraft. And the next slice of cheese might be when they built the aircraft. And the next one will be the maintenance of the aircraft. And the next one will be the training of the pilot, et cetera, et cetera. And there's all these layers. But each of these layers of defense against a problem or an accident has holes, little and big holes, but they're all in different places. So the thought that any tragedy could make its way through all of those defenses is really hard to imagine. Merrick says the rush shooting parallels the crow shooting, where more than just one thing went wrong. But in this case, as with Brandon Lee's instance, the holes happened to line up for that moment in that instance. And when you think about the the inexperienced armor who was hired by an inexperienced uh, unit production manager to work under a, an inexperienced prop master. Uh, and then you've got an overbearing first assistant director who, according to reports, had inserted himself in the handoff process and had possession of the prop gun, who called it clear and according to those reports, uh, testimony gave it to the actor Alec Baldwin telling him it was cold. And then on top of all that, there's six chambers in a, in a, in a uh, Western revolver. There was one live round. So even past all of those defenses, there's still only a one in six chance that that, would have, that hammer would have fallen on a live round and that he would have been pointing it at people, that people would have been standing there. It is such an anomaly and such a um, one in a jillion uh, chance that this had happened. That's why we were all so shocked. It's not like all the armors in Hollywood are like, oh, yeah, we've had all these close calls. It was about time. No, that is not the case. We know what we do. We block it out carefully. We check the ammunition carefully. We check the firearm carefully. We know exactly where the actor is going to be pointing. We make sure there's no one standing in that area. All of these failures had to happen. Each slice of cheese had a hole in it, and they all lined up in this instance. 
Taking a closer look at the facts of the case, we know that the shooting occurred in between takes when Baldwin was holding a Colt 45. Assistant Director David Halls handed Baldwin the weapon, saying it was cold, meaning it wasn't loaded. For his part in the shooting, Halls was charged and pleaded no contest to negligent use of a deadly weapon. Let's talk about that cold gun situation because that's come up a lot here, that Baldwin was handed the weapon that he was told was cold or safe. And he's saying it's not the actor's responsibility to check this if he's told it's cold, it's cold. What is your take on that? And in Baldwin's case, he's been doing this for 40 years. He's got 40 years of also doing gunfire on shows. And he's familiar with the processes, I would imagine. And he knows that in his 40 years, at least, he's never been handed a gun that had a live round in it. And in the history of Hollywood, within the last 100 years, there's never been a report of live ammunition accidentally or intentionally showing up on a film set. So he proceeds with the um, awareness that, yeah, it looks real and I and it's potentially deadly under certain circumstances if you put live rounds in it, but now it's safe and it's ready as a prop for him to go be that actor and be in that character and be in that headspace. As Merrick explains, there are many different jobs on a film or TV set, all working together to create the final product. He says it's not necessarily the responsibility of the actor to double check a prop gun. So. I want you to think for a moment about what are the responsibilities of an actor when they're on a set? What are the things that an actor is doing when that camera is rolling? They've memorized lines, they're interacting with other cast, they're creating another persona, they're being another person entirely. They're taking direction. Who are they taking direction from? The director, of course, the director of photography, a stunt person, a choreographer, a prop master, special effects. Everyone's giving them guidance and direction. They've got to find their light. They've got to find their mark. They may have to take on a limp or a physical affectation or a vocal affectation. And that's just the beginning. There's a lot more things that an actor is doing. Is there more room on the plate to make them the safety officer to make sure that the car is rigged right and they check the brakes on it before they do the stunt or that they prepare the prop food for the meal? No, we prepare everything for them very carefully. If they're falling off a cliff and we're going to check the ropes and make sure everything's safe and everything's secure. If we're, if they're doing gunfire, we're going to make sure that gun is prepared in exactly the right way for that scene, for that moment of that scene coming up. While some actors do double check their prop weapons, Merrick says Baldwin isn't at fault here. An actor has the right to check a gun and say, oh, okay, I see that those are blanks or those are dummies or this is empty. That is their absolute right. And I think a lot of actors stay in character they trust that we're gonna do it properly. And that is exactly our job to do that so that they don't have to worry about that. So I wouldn't hold personally, I wouldn't hold Alec Baldwin or any actor responsible for making sure the gun is safe. I have pledged to that person that this firearm is safe and I'll demonstrate it if need be. And here we go. And Baldwin had two sets of eyes for sure that he knew, check that gun first. He knew that it came from the armorer and then he had the second, the first AD who is the second set of eyes to verify that a any, pro, uh, any rigging or a gun is safe. Uh, and so here's Dave Hall's first AD saying, this is a cold gun, meaning he's inspected it. He's been the second set of eyes, gives it to Baldwin, who then has it to act out the scene with. If we look at the timing of the shooting, it happened in between takes when Baldwin was rehearsing. Merrick says some things went wrong here, but they weren't necessarily Baldwin's fault. Well, firstly, the crew shouldn't be standing there and whose job is it to observe that would either lie on the first AD, who's the overall chief safety officer. He may see something that looks like it might be an unsafe condition. Hey, there's a group of people standing in front of where an actor's pointing a gun. How about you people move out of the way? That's a pretty good idea. Secondly, the gun handler, uh, uh, Hannah Gutierrez Reed was not in the room when this happened. And they asked her if this had ever happened before where she'd handed off a gun and was not present. And she said, yes, it had happened repeatedly. So here's our young novice gun handler who has handed off the gun to the first AD. And by some reports, she was made to leave the room due to COVID protocols and maximum number of people in the room. Um, I've read the testimony. I counted 16 people in that room. Uh, there's one actor, two customers, three special effects, two or three grips, there's a whole slew of people and a gun on set and no armor. That armor would have been the person to say, it's their, it's their responsibility to say, hey, we're pointing a gun in this direction. All you people got to move. There was a monitor on the dolly that was holding the camera and that monitor mounted to the dolly is what our director of photography and director and others were looking at to check the shot, to check the framing of the scene. 
had that monitor been moved to the other side of the dolly or just not been there at all, they wouldn't have been standing there. Further, the camera crew that walked off that morning took with them, my understanding, the uh, video village monitor. When we set up a scene with a camera, they set up an external monitor in what we call video village so that the director and the script supervisor and DP and others can gather around the monitor and see what the camera sees. That had been packed up, my understanding, that morning or the night before and was unavailable. So now we're stuck with a little monitor on the side of the dolly, which because they were looking at that monitor right where it was and how it was positioned, planted everybody right there. Some reports that there was five or six people all right in front of the gun. As for the logistics of what happened, there are differing opinions. At Hannah Gutierrez Reed's trial, expert witnesses testified that the trigger had to have been pulled for the gun to fire, but that's not the same story Baldwin told the world. It wasn't in the script for the trigger to be pulled. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So no. you never pulled the trigger? No, 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 no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. In the weeks following this shooting, Baldwin actually appeared on Good Morning America, and he had this interview where he said, I never pulled the trigger. Now, this is coming back to haunt him potentially because some experts testified in Hannah Gutierrez-Reed's trial that the gun couldn't have gone off without the trigger being pulled. What is your take on this? I know you have experience there. Is it possible the gun went off without him pulling the trigger? Well, my understanding was that portion of that scene, he was to pull the gun out, point it toward the camera and cock it. My, that's my understanding of that was the, the action that he was supposed to do. So he would be practicing that. Now, I was a competitive shooter in the 80s and 90s, and I knew a lot about my kind of shooting, but I didn't know the Western guns as intimately as I do now. I've spoken to several uh, Western, uh, Western competitive shooters that shoot this exact type of gun, and a couple of them told me unequivocally, absolutely, that gun can have the hammer drop on a round without the trigger technically being pulled. And I have them demonstrate that to me. And I have one of those uh, guns that I use for my class. I teach a, a monthly class on prop gun safety here in Los Angeles. So I did a graphic exam uh, demonstration of that gun with that gun, where if you pull the hammer back, as you pull the hammer back, the trigger has to click forward into place. It has to slightly go forward just a millimeter or two and so if you impede the movement of that trigger, you don't have to pull it back. There's no effort on your part. But if you impede the movement of that trigger forward, the hammer can't catch and it drops and it drops past the halfway point, past the quarter safety, all the way till it lands on whatever's there. In this case, there was a round. So, and a friend of mine demonstrated if you've got thicker fingers, particularly it's easy. And if you've jammed your finger into the trigger guard to kind of hold the gun more steady, the meat of your finger can put a sideways pressure on that trigger. It's not pulling the trigger, but it's kind of binding it in place. Then when you pull the hammer all the way back, there's no catch and it'll drop all the way forward. So I've seen this repeated again and again, this exercise, and I was just shocked to find out. Now this is an old design, you know, this is designed from the 1860s, 1870s. We've improved things since then, but these reproductions that work exactly as they do, I've shown, I've seen how it is possible that hammer can be pulled back and dropped without actually pulling that trigger. So we know where Merrick sits on that side of things. It's possible the gun went off without Baldwin knowingly pulling the trigger. But what about the criminal charges Baldwin now faces? As we've talked throughout our interview here, we've mentioned almost a series of unfortunate events, one thing after another that led to this tragedy. But we know the ultimate ending, that one person died, others were injured, and that two people were charged with involuntary manslaughter. What do you make of those charges for both Baldwin and Hannah Gutierrez-Reed? So when we look at the chain of events, there are many hands on the, on the Ouija board here. There's many, many hands on the tiller of this event uh, from the hiring practices. I think the OSHA report, the New Mexico State uh, Occupational Safety Hazard uh, administration has an excellent report talking about the hiring practices and how this sort of chain of events of who you brought in to do the job and they didn't do the normal procedures uh, all led to this accident. Um, but you now we're charging two people. We have Hannah who's been convicted and now Alec Baldwin who's going on trial. But there's other people that have been taken out of the equation because they were made witnesses after the other two. Merrick points to the multiple other people involved in the Rust production, saying prosecutors should have taken a closer look at their involvement in the shooting. And the, probably the primary one of those to me is Dave Halls, the first assistant director, who uh, 
took possession of the gun, according to testimony, sat in for rehearsal, according to testimony, handed it to Alec Baldwin, according to sworn statements. So he he um, copped a plea, if you will. I don't know if that's the term, not copying a plea, but he took a plea deal where he had a $500 fine. And so for $500, he avoided all the jail. Uh, and then you've got um, Sarah Zachary, the prop master who handled the blank rounds, uh, who supervised her and was also working as an armor's assistant during this. And you've got Seth Kenny, PDQ Arms, who is purportedly the rep this provider of all the guns, dummies, and ammunition. Now, they've all gotten plea deals. Well, I should say Sarah Zachary and Dave Halls have plea deals to then testify against the other two to try to get a conviction. Uh, Seth Kenny of PDQ Arms, who provided the dummy rounds and very likely the dummies in question, uh, was not investigated. They looked at his facility 39 days after the incident. Uh, he, they never took fingerprints on him. They never took DNA. They never looked at his phone records. And in fact, the defense for Hannah Gutierrez Reed just brought up that the prosecutor gave phone records, including text messages of Hannah's phone to Seth Kenny as he was helping with the investigation. And the defense for Hannah points out that Seth has been sort of helping along the investigation the entire time, including uh, where to look and perhaps who to prosecute. So there's a few players that, that really have gotten away scot-free. Merrick believes there's a specific reason Baldwin now faces the involuntary manslaughter charge. Alec Baldwin, I think, is the shiny object. I think he's famous. He, you know, he did a lot of uh, Saturday Night Live lampoons of uh, Donald Trump, big right-wing character, and then so there's a lot of GOP people that want his head on a platter perhaps for that. But I think that being that he's the shiny object and someone can get a feather in their cap by prosecuting and convicting an actor, that's probably lending itself to why this uh, prosecution is happening the way it is. In your opinion, should Baldwin even have been charged at all? I really don't think Baldwin should, should have been charged in this. I think it was a, a workplace accident. I think it was a series of mistakes, a series of many small mistakes that added up to being a, a deadly error. And I, I again, I, it, it's kind of, it's really unfathomable based on past accidents on set that, that he would be charged with, with manslaughter, any level of manslaughter. In the case of Hannah Gutierrez Reed, Santa Fe jurors returned a guilty verdict in her manslaughter charge. We find the defendant, Hannah Gutierrez, guilty of involuntary manslaughter as charged in count one. We find the defendant, Hannah Gutierrez, not guilty of tampering with evidence as charged in count two. Merrick says he followed Gutierrez Reed's trial closely and plans to do the same for Baldwin. This half of things is speculation, but looking ahead to Baldwin's trial, is there anything you expect to see? I would imagine they're going to leverage a lot of the previous testimony from the Hannah Gutierrez Reed trial. I have a feeling they're going to bring in more expert witnesses that are perhaps better grounded in what the crafts do in the process of being on set. I think that the first trial missed the mark in conveying an understanding of how we work on a film set and how we create this sort of fantasy environment that is essentially very safe that allows actors to be completely immersed in this other world when they're clocked in. I would think that the uh, Baldwin defense would benefit from bringing professionals onto the stand that can speak to that and to speak to the level of trust that actors have in the property department and the armor department and really speak accurately to how we handle the guns on set. I, I saw some of the expert witnesses in the previous trial had, in my opinion, and the opinion of many of my peers, had missed the mark by a mile in their analysis of what was safe and what was unsafe and what were the standard protocols. This, I think, is an overreaction to try to put someone in jail for this. I think there's no way anyone should be serving jail time for this. I think that the young gun handler should not be in the business anymore, for sure, but I don't think Alec Baldwin should be charged with any degree of manslaughter. Baldwin has pleaded not guilty, and his trial is expected to last eight to 10 days. If convicted, he could spend up to 18 months in prison. Reporting for Long Crime, I'm Sierra Gillespie.